and how we've been applying it to our game design processes at Jagex Game Studios. So just a little introduction about myself so you know who I am. Um, most of you probably don't, so this is probably a good start. So I'm uh, a player experience manager. I used to be a game designer for about five years. I uh, worked with uh, some of the big names, uh, publishers, EA, Atari, um, Activision. And I moved over to Jagex about two years ago. And um, moving through the design team, uh, I started picking up kind of a, lo a lot of uh, respect for the, the UX kind of side of things and how those guys have been you know, changing the way they think about design. And, and I thought, you know, we should start applying that to our game design and thinking about the way that we can affect game design in, in, in a different way. So I work on a game called RuneScape. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of RuneScape. Anyone heard of RuneScape? Yeah, all, all played RuneScape. <laughs> so RuneScape is the, the world's largest free-to-play MMO. Uh, we've got 200 million accounts. We've got 12 years of content and we've got a really passionate player base. Some of them may be here. Um, so you might be thinking, well, that's that's awesome. Well, you know, why do you need to start changing the way you you, you think about your design? You know, you you're doing really well. That's that's fine. Well, well, I'll start. We'll go, go back a couple of years, and we'll we'll start to think about the way RuneScape began and where we started from, and why we started thinking about these things. So we started in 2001. That's a very long time ago, and the games industry was a very different place back then. Point and click was, you know, people, a lot of people still play those games. Uh, adventure games were still quite prevalent. And gra graphics and presentation hadn't become what they are today. Um, things were quite simple still. And back then, RuneScape was a very simple game, very accessible. Uh, and players expected a much steeper learning curve. We know today that, you know, you go to your iPhones, you go to your tablet devices, and things are much easier to pick up. You go straight into the game. The tutorials are slick and easy to play. And free-to-play was non-existent. We were one of the first free-to-play games, or serious free-to-play games at the time. So th things were looking very rosy. A few years on, 2004, we launched RuneScape 2. Throughout the years, we've been obviously in increasing the quality of the game. Um, point and click mechanics start to fall in popularity. You don't see many of those games around anymore. Presentation's getting be better. We know that the, the next-gen consoles are, co are on the horizon. Uh, and the learning curve is softening as well. As well as free-to-play is still very uncommon, so we've still got a winner there. RuneScape HD in 2008, so we know the, the HD consoles are here, so we, we tried to up things a little bit. We're still behind the times, we're still running in a browser, um, and point and click is almost, almost gone, uh, but free to play is on the rise. So coming to last year when I joined the team, um, we were looking at uh, resurgence and point and click, which is good for us. Um, presentation was a massive factor, so we had to really start thinking about the way we were, the way we were presenting the game to players. Uh, and the learning curve had gone almost flat, and RuneScape wasn't a very easy game to get into in terms of the learning curve. Uh, and free-to-play is a huge market, so we've got lots and lots of competitors now than what we didn't have uh, 11 years ago. So 2013, RuneScape faces a slick, polished industry with many free-to-play competitors and a veteran player base. So we need to start bringing in new players, but make sure that they are uh, you know, in introduced to a game that's easy and uh, nice to pick up on. So how do we meet this challenge? How do, how do we face the challenge of 2013 games industry uh, and, and the market that we're, we're in? Well, the power of UX. Nice big pink letters. So we, when we started thinking about it was, what, what lessons can we learn from, from the UX side of things? And we started looking into it in more detail and started, I started putting together some ideas along with the design team to the ways we can change uh, our approach to game design based on uh, UX principles and five key UR UX principles in, in particular. So we've got yeah, there's loads of these links, uh, those are these uh, quotes, I love quotes. Um, so what we wanted to do was, although we have game designers and Game designers are, are, the, are the glue between our programmers, our artists, and the public, and the guys that want to play the game. What we wanted to do was kind of bring across the, the, the effects of game design, the, the psychological effects of game design, and the user experience design, and kind of marry those two processes together. And although they might be very similar, um, it's in the differences we can learn from them. So obviously we're much very, very much player focused and uh, about setting goals and different things like that, but we don't necessarily deliver them in, in the right way. So what we wanted to do was kind of think of five different things that we could really target from the UX side of things. And the first one of those was a focus on people. 
uh, as game designers, we, ca we tend to be quite insular. We, we want to create the experiences that we love, the experiences that we want to, we're quite artistic. We want to deliver those things that we think are really, really cool. We don't necessarily always t think about the end user experience. We just think, oh, this is awesome. They'll really enjoy that. But we wanted to flip that on its head and start really thinking about the, the player at the start before we started making any kind of the game design. So let's focus on people. Who are you designing a game, uh, game for? Who are you designing your feature for? It's something we hadn't really done, done before. And the important thing here was people, not demographics. We often think a lot about, you know, it's a 16 to 24 year olds game, but that's a huge breadth of people. And that doesn't really focus on individuals within that community. Individuals that might have different opinions about different pieces of content, different psychological um, processes they might go through. So what we wanted to do is change our thought process there. Instead of large demographics, focus on individuals. And that's where we come to personas. Obviously, you know, anyone that works in the US will, will probably have uh, their own set of personas for their different products and start to think about uh, those. But what we didn't do is, we, we never really done this before. So what we wanted to do is set, create a set of personas uh, that we thought represented our community. So what we did was we, we, create, we collected a load of the demographics and we started breaking those down into actual individuals that had um, different ideas, different um, thoughts, different processes, things that they might have done in the community and really painted a picture of those people. Um, and what we did was collated pictures, we, we put them together and we made them into real people, except for Kevin, he's just there as a bit of a joke. Um, but what we, what we were able to do there is think about things in terms of an actual individual. So John here, he's Catrick, he's time poor, he's returned to the game for the nostalgia and the escapism. So we can start thinking about what features that John would want in the game. We can start designing game features surrounding that particular individual and, and then capturing that demographic as a whole. So it's, a, it's a more of a holistic view about your, your, uh, your game community. So what we can then do is help inform the design. So we can grab, grab Kevin, uh, and what, one of the things Kevin wants to do is he wants to chat while checking his location. So he's gone onto the world map, for instance, and he wants to chat at the same time. So what does he need? He needs his location, uh, he needs to access the chat box on the map, uh, and also we want to instill our product qualities upon that as well. So we always want it to be a social experience, so we want the, want the players to be able to do that. And then we just think about some of the constraints that might be applied to that. So that helps us build, in terms of feature, a set of spe specifications before we've even started any kind of you know, design for that, which is really interesting. So it's just kind of an overview of the way we use personas. I have a drink before I uh, go dry. Um, the second one was, was it's, it's quite interesting this one because uh, it seems obvious, you know, well, you, you'd definitely do that, wouldn't you? You always understand before you, you jump into it, but in game design, you know, the amount of times I've been interacting with different designers and they go headlong into uh, a full-on design or a, a feature prototype before they've even really started to understand what the problem they're trying to solve. So there's another great quote here. So make sure you can clearly articulate the core issue before spending an ounce of time developing the design. So a lot of people don't really understand what they're trying to solve. They're potentially trying to solve the top level of a particular design. They might be trying to solve something that is actually uh, you know, a, an offshoot of something much larger within the game. So the way we kind of uh, articulated this is it's not what about the player wants, it's about what the player needs. So we often have a vocal community that will say, I want this, I want this in the game, I want these things. But what we can do is we can collate that information and really sift through it, look at the player behaviours and understand what is it actually that they really need from the game so we can provide experiences that are going to be much more favourable to them than just delivering what they say, which is probably what, not what they actually want. So one of the things that, um, I don't know if you, any recent players, um, something we'd, we're working behind, on, uh, behind the scenes is um, bringing something we have called the quest list. So it's something we, we removed from the game for a, a various amount of reasons. And one of the things that the players wanted was the quest list back. Now, this is absolutely what, what they wanted, but it's not necessarily what they needed because you had much better ways of delivering that information to the player. So what they actually wanted was, uh, what they needed was a faster access to quest progression and instructions. Our old system didn't deliver that. Um, but what we could do is reduce the number of clicks to the core quest content. So then that, again, it helps us build a recommendation or a specification for the design before we've even started it. So it just it's helped building that picture before we run headlong into any design. And what that enables us to do is uh, empathize, sympathize, 
and visualize what the player is going through in any kind of particular situation. And that's really, really important as a, as a game designer and something that's often missing. It's often, often something that's very insular. And if you start doing that as a game designer um, early on, you have much better user experiences for the players to enjoy. Number three. Consistency. So consistency is obviously a massive thing. You know, the the previous talk that we just had there was you know a, a lot of really interesting points about keeping your your, vis your visuals consistent about your, the whole structure of your web pages, and that that's exactly the same for any kind of game experience. And we can we can apply that to every aspect of the game: the gameplay, the visuals, the narrative, all of the different themes associated with the game uh, as a whole. One of the ones we wanted to focus on is uh, the way that we deliver information. Uh, and consistency in information delivery is something we've been really poor on over the years. Uh, as an old game, things, uh, things move on, we add new systems, but a lot of that gets add on top of, add on top of, and we don't look at things kind of with an overall view. So what we had uh, for the start of the game, you know, if we refer back to uh, some of our goals at the beginning, we, we, you know, we were struggling with the tutorial and the way that players come into the experience. And what we were doing in our tutorial experience and a lot of other, the, the other pieces of game content is we were shoving lots of different pieces of information, all really primary to the user, in different places. So we, we were saying, OK, you really need to look over here. This is primary information. They're putting it down the left-hand corner in a chat box. They were putting one up in the top right-hand corner in a different window. That's really important information. Here's really important information. And that was just too much for the players to take in. They were missing different bits. They weren't understanding which piece of information they really needed in order to progress in the content. So what we did was, and just at the top there, actually, so when we play tested our, our, our tutorial, the tutorial content, we found that two hours of tasks that we designed to be two hours was actually taking four to six hours, which is a huge, huge um, amount of time compared to what we'd actually designed for because of these things and obviously a number of other little things as well. So what we did instead was we brought those things together and looked at the way we were delivering information in the tutor tutorial and actually the new tutorial that's going to be coming in, uh, in a couple of months' time and started to think about what we really want the player to know in order to progress. And we broke that down into primary, secondary, and tertiary information and made those consistent. So in our new tutorial and s edits that we've made to the current tutorial, we made the user aware of this. This is the primary place you need to find information. Other stuff is periphery. It's you know it's additional law or it's information that you don't need in order to progress. So that made it so that the players were immediately aware of what they needed to do in order to progress. And that meant that our two hours of task now took under an, uh, now took around an hour and a half instead of two hours, which is great. Um, and one of the things that consistency. Um, provides is this thing called predictab uh, predictability. And predictability sounds really weird in games, you know, well you don't want it to be predictable, but it, it really empowers the player. Um, and uh, you know, this is a great great quote there as well, I'm just keep firing these quotes out, they're, they're great. Um, is that the player can understand what's coming up to them. They, want, they don't want to go into a boss fight and not know the, the way to defeat that boss. They don't want to go into a quest and not understand that they're going to you know, die immediately as soon as they walk into that area. That takes the power away from the player, they need to be able to predict situations and defeat them and feel empowered. And that goes through all our tutorial experiences and throughout the game as well, we're trying to improve. Number four, recognition rather than recall. This comes back to some of our um, earlier stuff to do with quest content and also the tutorial. And when, when new players are going into the game, we would bombard them with information and then take out information away again and then expect them to remember it, which is an absolute no-no. Uh, it was something that really upset me when I started looking into the game and it meant that uh, what we were doing is making memory gameplay which for a modern audience is something that they don't want to do. They don't want to remember stuff in order to get to the next stage. They just want to enjoy the content. They want to play that content. And so what we wanted to do is start pulling away from that. And this is a really good one. So users shouldn't have to remember information from one part of the dialogue to another. And usually, obviously, that's something you apply to you know, web design. But we were thinking, no, that's what we should be doing as well. We shouldn't be expecting the player to remember all of this content in order to succeed in, in the game. We should just be enabling them to use their skill in order to su succeed in the game. That's not our goal to, to confuse them. And uh, w when I was going, w I went to uh, UX Cambridge. I UX London was uh, 
mentioned in the last one. I went to one of the talks there, which was really interesting about cognitive psychology. And and, and this this might seem really obvious to some of you guys, but I didn't know this. But um, usually people say you know it's between kind of like five and seven things you can remember, but it's actually between three and five pieces of information that anyone can remember at one time, which is really really small when you really start to think about it. So what we wanted to do was. Um, bring down the levels of information uh, and here's an example we used in RuneScape which is uh, when we introduced a new combat system which some may like and some may not like we think it's great um, what we did was we added to our existing interface system which was getting really bogged down over years and years of content being added to it and what that meant was that we were over over delivering on information for the player that in order them to remember while in combat. So this player over here is in a, in a combat situation and they've got to remember all of these different pieces of information in order to succeed in, succeed in battle. So we've got abilities over here in which you trigger in order to fight the enemies. We've got um, information over here about the enemies. Uh, we've got stuff over their heads. We've then got more information up in the, in the top right there about your health and different powers that you can provide using prayers. And then this actually is a choice. So you, if you want to have your inventory open, for instance, and use food or other things like that, the player has to make a choice, adding to the stress of the combat scenario, taking away from the skill uh, required to, to take on that particular enemy. So what we thought was, let's, let's reduce all of that down. Let's focus on what the player's going to be doing right now, and that's combat. So what we did was we brought all of that information that was up in the top right there and down in the top, uh, uh, bottom right into the, into the uh, player's view. So it's right in front of them so they can see it all, at all times. We made it so that targeting is much easier to see. And we brought these, all these different arrows that we had here as the player's eyes darting around all different places across the screen into a simple, simple shape that we knew that they would be able to pick up quicker and much more focused on, on the content that they need rather than uh, the content that we were forcing upon them before. And all of this is as part of a customizable interface system as well. So if the player feels more comfortable with this up the top here or if they want all of this on the, on the right hand side, they can then start to build that out themselves and focus the content where they want it to as well. And as I said before, remembering the instructions is not gameplay. We've, we're past that now. That was 10, 15 years ago. It's not gameplay. It should be intuitive. It should be easy to pick up. Uh, and it should be something that's enjoyable to interact with. Number five, me, ex me expectations. Now, when I did this one, I did this talk in uh, Brighton a few months ago um, to a load of uh, game developers. And this, this one is um, quite contentious in a way. Um, but... It's, it's really, uh, really interesting to start with this quote. So people bring a history of well-established routines when they use websites, desktop applications, and mobile apps. These expectations influence their experiences. Now, this is so, so, so true of games in particular. Because what this means is if you start to build a, a first-person shooter, if you start to build a platformer, if you start to build an RPG, a player is going to go into those experiences with a wealth of games that they've already played. There's very, very little players that are going to come to your game for the first time and be the first time they've ever played your type of game. It's just not going to happen. So what you have to consider then is that a lot of these players are going to come to your experience with an expectation about how the game's going to be played. So whether it's a first-person shooter, they're going to expect the right trigger to shoot. They're going to expect let right bumper to throw a grenade. They're going to expect A to jump, things like that. All of those things are expectations that, if broken, have a negative effect on your experience immediately. So those are the things we need to think about. So it's kind of underlined by this. Common me mechanics and accepted practices exist because they work. That's why they're there. They've evolved over time. That's why people use them. Now, this might sound kind of anti-creative um, or anything like that, but it, that doesn't mean that we can't be creative about the way w we design experiences. It's just the underlying core mechanics that support them. So this was, um, this, this was exemplified by um, the way that we were delivering some stuff to, to our, within our game and we're, we're working on at the moment. So when we, when we were doing our playtests uh, a couple of months ago, a lot of the players were getting to, this is the, the old version of the game, um, were getting to a particular scenario and they had to interact with the game world and their inventory. And they can see that they can drag things around their inventory. So wh when they were asked, oh, we want you to give this piece of material to this character, they would grab the thing from the inventory and drag it and drop it onto the, uh, the NPC in the game world. Well, that's, that's what you do, wouldn't it? That's, that's the expectation 
that other games, other applications have built up over the years. We didn't meet that expectation. We failed to meet that expectation. We didn't have that functionality within the game. So it meant the, the player came away with a frustration, uh, a disappointment against that particular piece, uh, piece of content. And the fascinating thing was that the power of expectation. Now, when we interviewed uh, or, or the testers interviewed these, uh, these players afterwards, they said to the players, OK, so how did you interact with the, the inventory and the characters? And the, the, ca the players went, well, well, I dragged and dropped it. Uh, it didn't work very well, but I dragged and dropped it. Their expectation of how that worked was so strong, they're overridden what was actually happening. So they'd accidentally combine the two things by clicking and clicking. Now, that's not what happens in the game, and their expectation was so strong that they believed they did the thing that they expected, but it just didn't work very well. So that's the power of expectation, and if you don't meet that, then you have problems later on in your game or website or other pieces of software that you might be creating. And coming back to me saying, well, that has to be how it works. You have to design your game around these uh, common mechanics. That's not how uh, things move forward. Um, you can build things within those mechanics, but still do exciting things within them. But just breaking, breaking those down at the start of the game without a very, very good reason, you're going to have start off on, on the negative, uh, with a negative experience. So... There were more, but I'd, I'd stick with five because I like five. So we started by focusing on people. That helped us build an understanding about the features that we wanted to create before we'd even started designing them because we used individuals. Then we started to understand, better understand the underlying problems that players were facing so that we could, again, start building out a design before we'd even really started. Then we started thinking about the way we were delivering information, the way we were looking at our graphics, our interfaces, and started to bring in our consistency. We're still not finished, but you know, I'd say it's a big game. Um, then we started to take away the effect players had on recognition and recall. So focusing things more on delivering information when the players needed it rather than up front and having to remember it. Number five, we started to meet their expectations. So we changed the way a lot of our new Quest content was designed and, and created so that it met expectations when they entered that, both in terms of how RuneScape worked, but how also how other applications and games worked as well. So the result of all of this, um, and the ongoing result, we haven't finished yet, is, uh, was RuneScape 3. So RuneScape 3, we, desi we designed a completely new interface system which was completely customizable. So the players had their choice the way they wanted to move, uh, use, thing, use the, uh, the game. We looked at the way we deliver quest content and we've got an entirely new structure un under, the, under the hood now that means that w when we're designing content, we, it's much more focused on the player than anything else. And above all, we started to think about the way that uh, we were delivering uh, our tutorial experience. So we're creating an entirely new tutorial experience which takes all of these different things into account uh, and means that the, the, the content is designed for players that are, are used to a more exciting and fresher uh, experience. So the one thing that kind of underlines this before I finish, um, probably really early because I'm do things very quickly, a little bit, yeah, um, is, is that all of this is backed up by player testing. What we've, what we've previously not done in, in, the, in the past is focus on uh, the player. So as I said, it's, that was our first point. So we started bringing the players in and started to work with them on some of our feature content and the way that they were interacting with it. So a lot of the things that we've, we've pulled from this are because players have told us that this is incorrect or because players have, have shown us that this is the way they interact with the content. So play testing has been one of the most valuable things that we've ever done and we, we're going to continue to do in the future. Um, I've gone very quickly, a bit nervous, it's a big place, um, but yeah, I thank you very much and um, any questions would be great. <laughs> thank you. Questions? No? Yeah. Um, yeah. Once again, um, your name, your game has a good name already, right? So yep. people know it. Uh, so you don't have a problem of critical mass. Mm -hmm. So if you had this problem, you were like uh, unknown game, and you would need to get the mass. Like, what would you do? Because, for example, 
that's our problem right now yeah or will be quite soon so tell us <laughs> 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 that's a very difficult question but it's a good question um i guess the thing is making a really good game to start with you know that's the starting point um ultimately you know when when we kicked off um with many many years ago what what we created was something that was unique to the situation so it it latched upon some of the the social hooks of the time so no one really had a place that they could hang out and play games but also talk to their friends and that's what runescape delivered back uh you know 11 12 years ago uh and so it hooked into kind of the the social scene at the time um but it was also a fun place for people to hang out and just spend time so that's how things work for runescape but for your game you have to start thinking about the way why is it fun Why is it going to be um, exciting for these players to to pick it up and also the platform that it's going to be on if you're looking at mobile or tablet or console or whatever it may be why is it going to be interesting what makes it s- stand apart from anyone else doing the kind of thing that you're probably doing because someone's probably already done it before or done a similar thing before so why is yours different why is yours better and why do people play it and if you've got really strong answers for all of those questions then you're at a good starting point critical mass is is a very difficult thing because word of mouth is incredibly po- po- uh, powerful we know that from stuff like you know minecraft very recently candy crush things like that but marketing is a big thing for a lot of those for the the secondary side of those companies so free to play is marketing is very very important um but getting critical mass is a lot of it is down to the quality of your game you look at the low games that get a critical max angry birds for instance it's just an excellent game under the hood uh and that kind of that's grabbing that social stinger at the time is really important so it's it's all making a really good game and making sure that you're coming onto the marketplace at the right time is is really important uh, and capturing capturing the the audience's imagination at that time it's really hard <laughs> hi um i you talked about a bunch of problems that uh runescape had before uh but my question is what was the biggest problem that you faced when uh you know making runescape 3 uh technological Technological is probably uh, one of the biggest problems we face. Uh so Ruskate's built on uh, Java and one of the things we wanted to do uh, one of the big technical challenge uh was moving over to HTML5. Um so we've got an entirely new engine which runs on HTML5. Uh it's one of the first it's well it's it's the only game of this size that that runs in HTML5. So that's still one of our technical challenges. It's something we're still working on really really hard. Um but making that kind of making the game more ubiquitous you pick with us across platforms is something we wanted to do it still is with java but we know that java is an aging uh, product we know that it's something that uh, you know the likes of um, apple don't necessarily push on their platforms and have banned in different different areas so we want to make sure that te- technology isn't holding us back from our audience and and from a potential new audience so i think aside from the game design side of things that's probably the biggest challenge in terms of game design it's it's connecting with a new audience um because we've got you know we're a really really successful game at the moment and um we want to continue being a successful game but we know that a lot of our players have been around for a number of years and we want to make sure that we've got new players coming in and supporting that that uh kind of that veteran player base as well so that's one of the things we want to do and that's kind of why we're taking this new approach to design and although it supports a lot of what we did with RuneScape 3 it is something that's going to continue for like the next couple of years and something we're we're focusing on until Christmas as well so making sure that when the players come into the new website the new tutorial the new content that we're supporting with all of that that uh they 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 resonate with it and they resonate both with uh an experience that's designed for now but is also very runescape as well because we know that we've got a big audience and there's a reason they're there so we just need to make sure that they can see that gold in the middle not gold farming So what would be the expected change in performance when you actually move over the engines from Java to HTML5? Is so there a difference? Uh there there is a difference um on higher performing computers. So um the what we've been able to do with HTML5 is uh take control of the user's hardware more. So utilize their graphics cards, utilize their processors. That's something we haven't been able to do with Java. Um we've got direct X integration, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work as well as it can do on HTML5. So those machines that have uh higher performing um hardware, we can really get the most out of those. 
uh, and with the lower performing hardware they struggle they're still struggling a little bit but it's something we're working with both with Firefox and, and Google in order to increase the the agility and performance of uh, WebGL as well so yeah it's it's something that's both on us and on the uh, the platform uh, holders as well so it's it's something that will will increase over time for sure Charles? Yeah. Yeah, Hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, you are using personas. Yep. And uh, you really focus on uh, these personas, uh -huh. then uh, on demographics. Mm -hmm. But how you created these personas, if not uh, on demographics? Yeah, so um, the personas are created in two ways. We use both. Um, data that we pulled from our community so we've got a huge wealth of data that we can we can pull upon so that that gives us a side of things that is um, much more focused on what we really know so we we can see that what players what pieces of content players are interacting with what percentage of p p players are interacting with that type of content who who plays pvp what percentage of the community is that so that means that we can we can build up a really good picture of the the kind of analytical side of what our player is but then we want to we do interviews as well so we sit down with our players and we start to work out what they start what they play with we also look at um, doing canvassing so we start to look at what what's the general community doing so what kind of pieces of content are they interacting with whether that be tv film other games uh, and understanding what what their interests are and that helps us build a, a, a greater picture so you know we might be looking at uh, you know capturing someone that plays cod, cod a lot uh, Call of Duty or someone that plays GTA more. So there's different things that we can then start to think about in terms of our diet design, what they might be more interested in. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's that mixed approach of basing things both on anal analytics and also um, you know, the other side of things, which is a little bit more personal and, and takes other side of things that you know, isn't on the analytical side. So it's a, it's a bit of both. Um, but yeah, it's a really imp interesting process, and it helps to really build a good picture of what what your what your players really are. Cool. <laughs> uh, simply just uh, Google user exp uh, uh, user research. You'll find uh, many articles about it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not supposed to be. But basically, I wanted to ask, you keep adding stuff to RuneScape, as you have said, constantly. Aren't you afraid that at some point you will have so much stuff that people that are coming into the game will get scared off by the complexity of the game? Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, the... <laughs> We, the way we, way we look at that is about con uh, content discovery is a big thing we're looking at at the moment and the way that we handle that. So obviously, yeah, we've been plowing like 10 years of content in the game. There's quests in there that are, you know, 10 years old now. Uh, and we want to make sure that's really accessible. There's kind of 880 odd quests, probably a little bit more than that now. And that's, you know, really overwhelming for a player coming into the game. So that's part of our new tutorial experience and the way we deliver that information. So it's something um, that starts off with, you know, interesting design and making sure that we understand what the problems are going to be for a player. So understanding what they want to do in terms of the freedom that they might want, but also trying to restrict it so they're not overwhelmed. So we looked at it, look at it in from two sides and trying to understand what types of player would want to jump into all of that content and what player, types of player would be scared by all of that content and start to break up that, the, the interfaces and the way that we deliver that content into a way that is accessible for both, both of those types of player. Um, so it's, it's an interesting challenge. It's something we, we're working out at the moment and we want to build something that um, is more accessible for the future so that we can keep applying content without it being overwhelming for new players uh, and build a structure that they get introduced to the game with with new pieces of content which are, are good and, uh, and really nice for them to play. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I just uh, always wanted to know how many people you got working on, on RuneScape, just uh, out of curiosity. Uh, a lot. Uh, so the studios, we have basically we have two studios within Jagex. So we have RuneScape and the Transformers team. Um, and RuneScape is must be around 150, 
150 people work on RuneScape. Um, that, that's all different types of people. So we have design teams around 10 people, and then we have lots of developers, so around 20, 30 developers, uh, big art team, animation, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we have obviously the management of creative services. We have a collection of support departments as well that help us out with everything's done in house as well. So our engine is all created in house, uh, all of our publishing, our marketing. So it's an entire ecosystem, mini publisher, if you like, just for an individual game. Um, something that some of the other guys in the UK don't really do. Um, you know, I think we're still the, the biggest UK um, developer slash publisher. So. Um, and then Transformers is around the same size as well. So, yeah, I think we're about 500, 450, 500. Uh, and then half of that is RuneScape related, 150 to 200. Yeah, I don't know exactly. There's a lot of people there. Some of them I don't even know. <laughs> well, great game, so congratulations. Cool, cheers. Bit quick, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this was the last of the presentations today. Well, tomorrow will be much more. Even tomorrow after. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Starting Daniel Nell. Next, Keith Moore on iOS development. I look forward to seeing you there, everyone. <laughs>